So in this video, we're going to cover how crop insurance and cover crops kind of tie in together. There is a fair number of rules that maybe don't support the farming practices that the NRCS is pushing us towards between cover crops and crop rotation on the crop insurance side, although things are getting somewhat better from that standpoint. So one thing that's new for 2020 is, um, which it'll talk about in this sheet, if you look up cover crops MPCI on Google, you can find the same cover crop sheet. It says for crops planted in 2020, which we'll see here, crop year and later, your insurance will now attach at the time of planting the insured cover crop. And uh, the management practices will be reviewed under the RMA rules for good farming practices, which means that you actually can do some things outside of the NRCS's cover crop termination guidelines and still insure it as a cover crop without an egg expert um, chiming in on it too. Before, if we wanted to seed winter wheat, um, even as of this last year, if you had full season cover crop growing or any kind of cover crop growing during the crop year, you had to terminate it 30 days prior to seeding winter wheat. Now, now they're going to be a little more flexible on that, that appears. So that's one good change here. Um, as we get into this next page, this is going to show you which term is it, termination zone we fall into for cover crop stuff. So as you can see, everything in Montana pretty much is in this brown zone up here. If you look down on the bottom, brown zone one is um, you need to terminate the cover crop 35 days or earlier before planting, except to get the RMA summer follow practice. So that, that would all just apply to fall planting. If it's spring planting, you can seed right into greened up cover if you want, um, as you'll see in this next slide. We'll cover the summer follow thing too. That's one big hang up for people. They'd like to start replacing summer follow with cover crop, which would be fantastic as far as soil health goes. As you'll see in these rules still though, there's really no way to do that. So um, in zone one anyways, for late spring to fall seeded crops, you need to terminate that cover crop 35 days or earlier prior, prior to planting the crop. That's the one now going into 2020 where they'll actually allow you some flexibility in that. So if you've figured out that it's going to work to terminate your cover crop a week before you seed winter wheat, and it obviously doesn't appear to be a bad farming practice, that'd still be insurable without an egg, egg expert now, the way the rules run. So in early spring seeded crops, you could have full season cover growing all the way through this year not terminate it in the fall, maybe some stuff greens up in the spring, you spray that out and you can seed right into that in those spring seeded crops. So the, the only thing we're really worried about that 35 day thing on is possibly winter wheat. And like I said, there's some more flexibility on that too. What is a, a concern to people though is this RMA designated summer follow practice. So if you look on the sheet, it says see definition 13. When we get to definition 13 of this stuff, you're gonna see that. Let me skip ahead one more slide here. RMA summer follow practice. If cover crop is planted during the fallow year, the acreage may be insured under the summer follow practice for the current crop year, which would mean the um, following crop year, provided that the cover crop was not hayed, grazed, or otherwise harvested. Well, there's the first problem, right? The whole point of seeding cover crop usually um, to, is to ramp up soil health and grazing cattle across that helps a lot. If you graze that during any time during that year it was seeded to cover, it's going to be recrop on the crop insurance as it's stated now. The other thing is, let's say you didn't hay or graze it or harvest it, you have to terminate it in accordance to the guidelines, but no later than June 1st. Well, around here, we're usually, if we're going to put any warm season grasses in there, we're trying to get this stuff seeded in the middle of May to the 1st of June. So long story short, if if you substitute what would have been summer follow with cover crop, there's almost no way that you're going to get to call that summer follow practice for the next year, the way the rules are written now. We hope, really hope that changes in the future. Um, the other concern when you get into do more diverse cropping is the crop rotation guideline stuff with the multi peril So there, there is breaks you have to have between all these broadleaf crops to have that be insurable. Um, this chart you can get off our website. That's kwsunburst.com. And um, it'll just show you like, hey, this year I'm gonna plan on seeding lentils. How long of a break do I need? So you'll see the current year's planned crop here. Let's say we're gonna do lentils this year. Then you can look over on this chart and see the last time I had lentils in there had to be two years, two crop years prior break before I could see lentils again. So if during the current crop year, you're gonna see lentils, you couldn't have lentils the year prior or the year prior to that. So there has to be a two year break in there. Between lentils and peas, you only need a one-year break. So you could do wheat, then peas, then lentils, then wheat, then peas, because there only needs to be a one-year break between those two crops. 
going back to similar crops, that's where you have to have that two-year break or it will be uninsurable. Um, chickpeas are a weird crop. As you can see, if this current year's planned crop is chickpeas, the only stipulation on how long uh, as far as the rotation break needs to be for chickpeas is you couldn't have seeded chickpeas any time in the last three years, basically. So chickpeas need a three-year break. So if you seeded chickpeas this year, you're going to have to go through three full crop years before you go back to chickpeas on that ground again. And then you'll see there's mustard and canola on here too, which have some rotation restrictions. That'll be updated in the spring again on our website, but these are the closest, um, the guidelines using last year's actuarial information. If something changes, of course, we'll change that for you guys too. So what's our experience been with cover crop? I'm just gonna kind of walk you through all the different stuff we've tried here. So the very first year we did it, we did triticale, millet, sorghum sudan, forage peas, lentils, turnips, and radishes. Um, so good mix of stuff we have, uh, Brassica, brassica type, type crops in there, which are turnips and radishes that help break up hard pans. Forage peas and lentils, both a, um, a, a pulse crop, so we were adding nitrogen back in the soil with that. Warm season grasses, which would be sorghum, sudan, and millet, and then the triticale. The good, we had really good ground cover, sprayed out before seed sets. So we didn't have any volunteer issues. On that note, we really haven't had volunteer issues in cover crop. I don't know why, but we just don't seem to have that issue as much as you'd think we would. Um, the bad, we didn't graze that, and the combination of forage peas and triticale made seeding difficult. This was prior to when we had a disc drill, it wouldn't have been an issue there, but with a hoe drill, it kind of wanted to rake up in there. The peas and the lentils in the mix put us two years out to either peas or lentils in a rotation. So there's one more important point, whether that is in a cover crop or it's an actual crop that you seeded, if you put peas in your cover crop, yellow peas, then you have the same rotation restrictions as though you harvested that crop off of that field. So what we're trying to do is avoid putting those same um, crops that are in our rotation into our cover crop for that reason. The other good reason not to do it is you're already getting that diversity in your rotation, so why not use a different pulse crop in the cover crop than what we're getting in our rotation otherwise? So we seeded this stuff too early. The ground was too cold for the warm season grasses to get going. I'm kind of coming to the conclusion no matter what we do with warm season grasses up here, we're going to have trouble getting them going if there's any competition there for them. But we're grazing the neighbor stuff right now, which will be in a separate video. That was all warm season grasses. Um, no cool season grasses with turnips, radishes, and, a, and a, some sort of a, it looked to me like a cow pea or something mixed in there. And that warm season grass, it was seeded later in the spring, so it should have had a chance to get going. It grew all the way through the summer. We had a pretty exceptionally hot summer with plenty of moisture there, and it still really didn't get going. So uh, the warm season grass thing is a hard thing to make work if there's a lot of competition in, in the cover crop mix. I think it'd be really interesting to try like sorghum or millet, maybe just with some vetch, see that a little bit later and just see how that does without the competition in there. But still good because you're, you're getting a mix of crops in there with the warm season grasses that feed some different soil biology that we don't get in a rotation. So there's a picture of that. You can see the triticale grew up pretty good. Um, the cow peas or forage peas or whatever are kind of vined out in there. And, and I think we might try a similar mix or whatever with some triticale in it. We have been using forage oats, but I really like the cover that crop provides. So then in 2016, um, we seeded this on some ground that was in wheat. This was before we really got our soil health ramped up. Now, no doubt in this here that a starter blend would have probably doubled the biomass because there was some serious nitrogen stress there. Seeded way too early. We seeded it about the 5th of May. The, the ground wasn't really warm yet. Like I said, didn't get warm season grasses going again. And um, seeded in an area that we could graze. So we got about two months of grazing out of 100 acres of 70 yearlings. So that, that was good. It was a drought year, but then it didn't leave a whole lot of stubble there available for the next year. So um, this just shows our cover crop, crop, cover crop cocktail mix about what it cost. So at that point, we're about $27 an acre in seed costs. We've got that whittled down to 14 or 15 bucks at this point. Um, the cost of seeded, of course. So all in there with the more expensive seeder, about 43 bucks an acre. I think we can get that down to about 30 bucks now. And we talked about the fertilizer aspect. As our soil gets healthier, we're kind of seeing we can cut fertilizer, whether it's on cover crop or on the cash crop, and not see nearly big of a detriment as we're seeing here. So this is that cover crop that year. You can see it didn't get really very tall. There was decent diversity, but not a lot of ground cover. We did get a fair amount of grazing out of it. And now that actually shows up 
that field years out now is starting to produce a lot better crop than the crop that didn't have the cover on it right next to it. So you can see the yellowing in these plants, how thin it, the stand kind of was. And we had some moisture issues, but we also had a fair amount of nitrogen stress there. That starts to go away as we get farther into the soil health end of things. I can see that. But if you're a guy that's just doing wheat fallow, wheat fallow, if you're going to seed cover for the first time, it's going to be hard not to put some starter fertilizer with it and, and kind of get that going ahead of time because you're not getting a lot of nutrient cycling from the soil. As you get that ramped up, like I said, I think we can cut the fertilizer out of the cover again completely, but it, it can be a detriment to your biomass if you don't put any with it um, and you're just doing a wheat fallow type rotation. These are always the pictures people like to see. This is a purple top turnip. Obvious huge amount of biomass there. Leaves a pretty good sized hole in the ground. Uh, a lot of protein for the cattle to eat on the top end because it stays green a long time. And then all that, that turnip actually will break down. So it mined all that deep nitrogen and, and stuff out of the soil, release some phosphorus. The turnip's going to break down and then it's going to release, release fertilizer for the next year for that crop to you. So it's like a bunch of little fertilizer um, prills kind of stuck all over. And when it breaks down, it releases it for the next crop. Uh, sunflowers, there's some more purple top turnips. The sunflower is a good deep-rooted crop that we don't get in our rotation. One problem that customers have had with sunflowers with a cover crop mix is they'll grow up pretty big and they have a really tough stock and they actually will um, rip nozzles off a sprayer boom sometimes if you're not careful when you're spraying. We had one customer where it flipped the fuel drain tank on the bottom of his case tractor. There's that valve you can turn to drain the water out. The sunflowers caught that and it drained a bunch of diesel out of his tank. So... There's some headaches with sunflowers if you let them get too big. How do we do our variable rate stuff? This is a fertilizer prescription. It shows you that we split this field into three different zones. It's not necessarily that the green zone's all in one spot, right? This is a better part of the field and this is a green zone or we have a water bottom over here. Anytime um, we go out and sample this, we sample all these green zones separate from the yellow, separate from the red. So we've taken this 400 acre field we split it into three different zones for sampling. We get different sample results back. Our yield goal is not as high on the red zones as it would be on the green. So we just plug all that into a spreadsheet. We know about what the crop needs for pounds of hand per bushel and stuff. And automatically have the either the sprayer or the seeder ramp up and down the nitrogen rate. And we've always uh, actually found probably as good or better a return from up in the seeding rate to higher rates in the better ground and dropping it a little in the the worst ground too. So we're very in, the, very in the rate of the seed always through the drill. Sometimes we'll vary the rate of the fertilizer through the drill. Sometimes we'll just put a flat starter on and then vary the rate through the sprayer. It just all depends on what route we want to go with fertilizer for that year. This shows cover crop versus fallow. This is the year that it's seeded back into crop. We had some nitrogen tie up in that next year yet, still where that cover crop was. What's interesting now as we go forward, um, multiple years from this, it would almost be flip-flopped where the cover crop side would be greener than the side that didn't have the cover on it. But the point of this slide is to show you, well, especially when we're in a drought cycle, we can have some yield drag the year or two following cover crops, just like you would if you'd recrop versus fallow. But long-term, we're seeing big benefits where on satellite images, this cover crop side shows up substantially healthier now every year going forward with the same fertilizer compared to the side that didn't have it. So um, don't be frustrated if the first year you have some yield drag because years forward on that, you're building so much soil off, it's more, it's definitely going to offset itself. Um, in 2017, then we tried it seeding on piece double. So this was on piece double because there'd be more nitrogen there, right? More available in. We use a starter blend. So we put 100 pounds of 1620 down there. So 16 units and 20 units of phosphorus, 13 of sulfur. It didn't rain at all after June 12th in a long stretch of really hot temperatures. And you're going to see the amount of biomass we were able to produce on this piece double with this stuff it was really pretty phenomenal. So this is the start of that crop year when that cover crop was growing. You can see the amount of biomass that we had started in there. It continued to grow all the way through the drought without any water available there. And this is about um, 70 cow-calf pairs. And I think we had 50 yearlings in here on this 100 acres for a couple of months. And so huge amount of carrying capacity compared to rangeland. And this field has really turned a corner on nutrient cycling where this last year we had 100 pounds of available nitrate nitrogen to use in there. Um, we put spring wheat in there, hardly fertilized it, and grew about a 40 bushel spring wheat crop on six inches of rain. So 
it's really fun to see this stuff kind of cycling, starting to work. We intensive grazed cows across this the next time we did it, and it really ramped up the soil health, I think. So um, rule of thumb, treat cover crop like any other crop. Fertilizer helps a lot. That being said, I think once we get the nutrient cycle working again, you can skip the fertilizer part. But if, if you haven't done much cover cropping and you're just kind of getting into this and you don't have a diverse crop rotation, fertilizer is definitely going to pay for itself in there. Um, pulse crop in the cover may not be a good idea if you plan on using them in your rotation. So pick a pulse, a nitrogen fixing crop that you can put in there like vetch um, or cow peas or something that's not going to affect your crop insurance rotation going forward. Unless you just want to use that as your pulse in your rotation, then don't worry about it. So uh, wait to seed warm season grasses and broadleaves till the ground's warm, usually late May for us. That's a must if you're going to do any kind of warm season stuff because the cool season grass will all compete that. Cattle really make the system work well, not only from the fact that you get income from it, but from the fact that the cattle are dropping manure everywhere, which is ramping up the soil health. So that's really the end of this show. I just kind of wanted to take you through some of the crop insurance stipulations. I think things are going in the right direction, but um, they've got a ways to go. They should be supporting what we're trying to do here, not hindering it. But uh, if you guys ever have any questions, feel free to call us or email us at our office. And 